Well, welcome to Factions. This project is gonna be so awesome. Uh, we are looking forward to it. It's always like, it's just awesome. You might be scared right now, and you should be, but in the end, you are gonna be so glad that you went through all of this. So uh, here is where you write your name. We're gonna do something like we haven't really ever done before. And that is like a active uh, research and background building knowledge process where you use the entry document not just to develop need to knows but to actually take some action uh, with regard to those need to knows. And that is what you are going to be working on in this document. You're going to be handing it in at the end of the hour. When you're done, you have a bunch of annotations on the entry document and the back of the entry document, that's why it's extra large. Um, is going to be full of notes. And I'll show you how that works. You have in front of you a large selection of very excellent pieces of writing that range from, oh, uh, this is about the Folger Library to, uh, there's a picture of the bard himself. Uh, here's when anxiety hits at school. Uh, teens who suffer from anxiety disorders. Uh, because the play that we're going to read, Romeo and Juliet, what is it about? Hmm, not, it's not childish, it's about childishness. I thought it was about love. Hmm, uh, star-crossed lovers. We're gonna dig into all of that. And so, as you work your way through this video, um, you are going to frequently pause. I guess I'll just put some instructions right here. You're gonna frequently pause the video as you need to, to read things that are of interest to you and that directly attack your uh, need to knows that you're developing as you work your way through. So let me give an example. Uh, the first thing that you see in this letter, this contest letter is Folger Shakespeare Library. Well, what on earth is that? Who is Folger and why does he have a Shakespeare library? And why is that library uh, in Washington DC of all places? Well, the answers to your question, those questions, is actually in this document. Here's a picture of the Folger Shakespeare Library. Here's a picture of the first folios of a lot of Shakespeare plays. 42% of the known existing copies, they're in a vault at the Folger Shakespeare Library. What is up with that? This is from a novel called, or not a novel, but a work of nonfiction called The Millionaire and the Bard. And so if you want to know more about that, um, you can read this. It is available to you right now. It's right in front of you. So you can go ahead and stop the video and uh, read about that if you want. And as you read about that, you'll flip this over. And just so that you can uh, locate your notes, this is information you're going to share later on with your group. So you might indicate, oh, the millionaire and the bard. Okay, so the millionaire and the bard. You're going to give yourself a little spot here. Millionaire, that's not how you spell millionaire, I'll just do that, millionaire, and the bard, and then you underline it, and then you're going to have whatever bullet points you take from uh, this particular piece of writing. You might just talk about the pictures, but if you dig in, it's got a whole chapter from this book. Now, you might not read all of it, but had I the money, you would come. Huh. In 1635, 12 years after the publication of the first folio, an undistinguished man named Peter Folger emigrated from Norwich, England to Watertown, Massachusetts. So this ends up being one of the things that ties Shakespeare to the United States, which might be a need to know. Maybe one of those need to know is like, why are we doing this? Or what's up with this? What does Shakespeare have to do with the United States? Well, quite a bit. So uh, that is, and I'm gonna annotate this as I go through. So if you stopped and did your notes, that's great. Um, but if you wanna stop later or research later, I'm just gonna put in here, Millionaire and the Bard. There's a place that you can go to for more information on that. Um, moving down, we have here, Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Um, so this one, if you're interested, if you're saying, wait a minute, what's this play even about? What is going on? Um, and uh, you look for like, I don't know, you're just building your knowledge. This is a great piece to read right now. It is called A Pair of Star-Crossed Lovers. So if that's where you want to go right now, you can take a pause on the video and read Pair of Star-Crossed 
lovers. Now, if any time if someone else is reading a document that you um, want to read, just keep on following the video. You don't need to pause the video. You can uh, go back later and read that, or you can find out what's, uh, what's next in this video and read then. I have been uncommonly engaged and interested in reading Shakespeare. Those plays, if they are read by anyone with a view of the treachery, perfidy, treason, murder, cruelty, sedition, and rebellions of rival and unbalanced factions. He will find one of the most instructive examples for the perusal of this country. So this is tying together the USA and Shakespeare. Because this is a really interesting piece uh, of writing here. It is from one president to another president. They happen to be father and son in 1805. And he's saying, hey, if you want to really understand uh, the kind of things you need to understand to, 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 to lead our country with its factions, we have factions in our country. And you'll learn a lot about that as we go through this project. Uh, if you really want to understand that, Shakespeare is the key. And so if you want to uh, learn more about that, there is a piece of writing that has uh, our very own Arkansas's own Bill Clinton referencing Shakespeare, and it is called the Shapiro Clinton text. And I'll show you what it looks like. It looks like this. So it doesn't, it, on one side it has an introduction by James Shapiro, on the other side it has a uh, a uh, foreword that was written for a book by Bill Clinton that's all about Shakespeare and the United States and how important Shakespeare has been to our development as a country, which seems kind of crazy, but it's also true. Uh, digging deeper. These themes right here, treachery, perfidy, treason, murder, cruelty, sedition, and rebellion, wow, that's what Shakespeare's all about? Really? Uh, yeah. Shakespeare is, so I love to teach Shakespeare so much because there's no bottom. You know, like if you're learning how to, I don't know, hook up a stereo or something, once you do that, you've got it figured out. But if you're learning how to be a human being, there is no bottom. There's no, there's no limit to the depth that you can go to in examining the, uh, the, I don't know, the challenges that human beings face in life. And that's why Shakespeare is an important foundation of philosophy. And so if you want to read something that is going to challenge you, if you want to read something that's going to blow your mind, um, but it's also going to be a struggle to understand, there's a piece in there that is called Shakespeare's Philosophy. Philosophy. And... Uh, it also has a title of General Themes, and that is something that would be totally awesome to read if you want to figure out what is really going on in Shakespeare. It looks like this. Moving on, Romeo and Juliet was the first Shakespeare play performed in the United States. It is celebrated as the greatest love story ever told. But is the play really about love? Well, what is the play really about? Hmm, there's a text for that. So again, at this point in the video, maybe you've taken one or two sets of notes and you've got them right here. You are gonna be reading the entire class today. So when it's all said and done, you should probably have a couple different sets of notes here with your different uh, titles and all the things that you've learned from reading your documents. This video is gonna be about 20 minutes long, but class is like an hour and a half long. So uh, if you haven't paused the video yet and get a, given something to try, you might want to do that at this point. Uh, greatest love story ever told? Hmm. According to this writer, it's really about childishness. Um, it's about childishness. So this is called the Berlaski. So we, when we, we, a lot of times we refer to pieces of writing by the author um, in this kind of situation. So I'm just going to call this the Berlaski text. I'm going to call it Ber. Lasky, because that's a great name. Probably a Russian name, because it ends in Y. Almost like my name. But is the play really about love? What if the play were instead understood as an exploration of the human cost of dueling politi fa political factions mentioned by John Adams in the excerpted letter above? 
the two households that complicate the courtship of Romeo and Juliet and ultimately destroy their lives could then be viewed as rival factions, the type of rival factions that Adam, that had Adam's concern for the future of the United States. This interpretation, all right, so this word interpretation is really what it's all about uh, when it comes to understanding Shakespeare. And so I'm going to direct you at this point to something that's going to help you with your um, interpretation. Um, one of them is this one right here that is called William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It's got a lot of different, uh, it's got a lot of different things. A lot of times groups end up like pulling this one apart because um, it's got so much good information, but it's, uh, but a lot of people want to read it at the same time. So if you want to, uh, don't do that today. Don't do that today because you're not in your full groups yet. Uh, but this one, uh, I call it the uh, Cooper text. So if you want to take a little while, and you don't have to read the whole thing, you know, when you take your notes on the back, you might just open it up and see kind of like, I don't know what's in this text, read it for five or 10 minutes, and then come back to this video. But when you do take your notes on it, you'll make sure that on the back, which by now might be halfway filled with notes, you'll have a different section on whatever texts you choose to annotate, but make sure you just point back to whoever it is that created the text before you take your notes. Moving along, interpretation of Romeo and Juliet. Is it a mushy meditation on love into a powerful tool for understanding the development and evolution of the United States of America? Mushy meditation. So now, if you are listening to this video and you listen to the first 11 minutes and you are lost, confused, you don't know why anybody would care about Shakespeare, you personally don't care about Shakespeare, if you're feeling that way, I've got something for you. It is actually a link in your agenda to a PowerPoint that is annotated by me. Um, and that PowerPoint is called, or PowerPoint, Google Slides. Actually, it is a PowerPoint. It's a PowerPoint video. That's what it is. PowerPoint vid, and it is called Not Boring. And you can, uh, I, I, in that, I will try to make an argument to you. I will try to convince you that Shakespeare is not boring, even if you think that he is. That's one of my favorite arguments to make to young people because I think there's such, so many things uh, in Shakespeare, particularly in Romeo and Juliet, that are just for you. They really are for you as young human beings. Um, human beings are human beings. And uh, if you could do me a favor, this will be uh, really fun. Uh, but what I want you to do is to, um, where I'm indicating with my pen right here, is to make a number three. Just draw a number three right there, right where my pen is, right there. This contest has been organized by the Folger Shakespeare Library to fold, provide emerging theater companies with an opportunity to enact. And this is a word, if you don't know it, Guess where you should go to check out that word? What does that word really mean? It's also in this PowerPoint. So I would say almost everybody should check out this PowerPoint video. Addresses the following thematic questions. How have factions shaped US history? Uh, so what are plays about? What are Shakespeare's plays about is actually part of your job as an interpretation. And so factions, yes. But this play is also about, in a very big way, an important way, mental health. And particularly mental health in young people. And so I have a couple of articles here that are going to help you understand what's up with mental health uh, for young people in 2018. One of them is called uh, When Anxiety Hits at School, because it is about, very specifically, uh, young people, anxiety, pressure, um, and uh, you'll probably gain a lot from reading it. So this is written by Nancy Dwyer, and so uh, there is the Dwyer text. That is one text that is mental health related. Another one is, uh, I'm gonna call it Death Trip, because um, addictive love and teen suicide is really a theme that was in this play that was written in 1595. So um, some things change, and you know we have a lot of technology, but the struggles that young people encounter in becoming adults, 
really maybe hasn't changed all that much necessarily. So you have the Dwyer text and you have Death Trip um, are two texts that you might want to look into. Okay, so at this point, um, you definitely have probably filled in half of this paper with your notes. So mine is blank right here, but yours is very full here. It's very full here. Um, on the front, you've got your name, you've got your block. You also need to give a space for a knowledge and thinking score because today is a day of reading and understanding and it's actually hard work. Um, so I think that probably some uh, knowledge and thinking recognition for uh, the evidence that you're leaving of your work. You know, this is evidence of, uh, of knowledge, of thinking. So what do we have next? Next we have um, each group will be, so this is what you're actually gonna do in the project. Um, each group will be responsible for the performance of an excerpt. And you're gonna have an audience for that. And so there's a text that might answer some of your need to knows that have to do with um, an audience that's also gonna have great background on William Shakespeare. It is called A Brief History of the Audience. So this is the text that you want to examine. For that reason, History of the Audience is waiting for you to take notes on and to understand and to read. Um, we get down to the nitty gritty. These are the things that you're actually gonna produce in the project, but at this point, I'm gonna get close to closing out the video with another a couple, a couple other things. There are other things in the folder that I have not yet mentioned. One of them is basically a source of fun facts. I know you young people love your fun facts. There is a document for that, and it is called Globe Education. And it is waiting for you, and it looks like this. It's got a great picture of William Shakespeare on the front. And uh, on the back, it's got interesting, um, well, did you know? Great little fun facts. If you're uh, in the opposite direction, and if you've worked your way through this video and you have a good chunk of time left in class and you feel like you're up for a challenge, this mm, is probably the most complicated text we've ever put in front of you. It is awesome. It is written uh, by a scholar that I respect a lot whose name is Harold Bloom. And uh, you will struggle with this, but it answers the question. In fact, it starts right here. With this question, a lot of people say, why Shakespeare? <laughs> and hit Harold Bloom, he just lays it out there. The answer to the question, why Shakespeare, must be, who else is there? Who else is there that does what Shakespeare does for us as human beings? Uh, nobody would be his answers. So he talks about this. There'll be a lot of things you don't understand in this, but he gets to the very core of uh, what Shakespeare has to offer to humanity. And Harold Bloom thinks, Harold Bloom thinks that Shakespeare deserves credit for inventing human beings. <laughs> if that, if that makes any sense to you, that is how much, that is how important this particular, uh, writer who's 87 years old and he's taught at Princeton University for most of his life. Um, he thinks that Shakespeare deserves credit for inventing human beings, at least as far as our machinery of self-reflection and thinking. And so that is a really cool thing to read, um, but good luck with it because it will be probably the hardest thing you've ever tried to understand. And that is called Shakespeare's Universalism. And you are also more than welcome as you're filling up the sheet. So on your knowledge and thinking, if you've got it filled from top to bottom, that's an hour of note taking. I think that's a reasonable ex uh, expectation. Then for this knowledge and thinking score, you're looking at 10 out of 10. Um, if it's partially filled, then we'll just kind of go down the, down the scale. Um, so we should see this totally, I'm just right like, whoo, totally filled, totally full of your notes, because you have a lot of time to read. And that is the end of this. There are other things in your folder that I did not mention. Feel free to read those and try to make sense of them. And uh, by the end of the day today, you will know your company. Have a great day.